his cousins introduced him to a game, Dungeons and Dragons. In the eighth grade, he started drinking and doing drugs, and it was during that time that he met a friend, Snake, who introduced him to Satanism. He joined a satanic group known as the Sons of Satan. The group had grown in size to nearly 1,500 people, some as young as 11 years old. Like in D&D, they have witchcraft and stuff like that, which is a part of Satanism too. F Hi guys, Harps Harps here. Welcome to my channel. Today we're going to be looking at the history of the Forgotten Realms in 4th edition Dungeons and Dragons. If you haven't seen the other episodes in this series, then the links are in the description below. Just before we get started, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who has subscribed so far. I passed a thousand subs the other day and that's a really big deal for me. This channel really only started because my girlfriend encouraged me to do it during lockdown back in April when I had nothing else to do in the house and I was initially skeptical but I'm glad I did it. And not only do I enjoy making the videos but I really love it when you guys leave a comment and get into a discussion over the lore or whatever else I'm talking about, so thank you. Okay, let's go. 4th edition Dungeons and Dragons was officially released in June 2008 and it was met with some mixed reactions from fans. Its development was announced in August 2007 and this did not go down well with players of D&D given that 3.5 edition which had proven popular was only released in 2003, so that's a 5 year gap, which I suppose doesn't sound too unreasonable but for D&D it kind of is. There was a 12 year gap between AD&D and AD&D 2nd edition, then an 11 year gap between 2nd edition and 3rd edition. So why was 4th edition released so much closer to 3.5 edition? Well, this had something to do with it. From the hills of Iron Forge to the burning cities of Stratholm. Millions of heroes from around the globe have joined forces in a battle. That has only just begun. World of Warcraft and MMOs in general had become so popular that Wizards of the Coast believed that they would kill the tabletop roleplaying market. And I suppose you could say that Wizards jumped the gun here because in a desperate bid to compete with this rising competitor, they changed much about the game. So much so that the roleplaying game which had for so many years defined all roleplaying games became heavily focused on combat. However, like every edition of D&D, each game of course depended on the dungeon master and the group of players. I suppose one of the biggest nods towards 4th edition trying to be more like an MMO was that every class now had powers. These were separated into attack powers and utility powers, which themselves were then separated into encounter powers, which you could use once per encounter, at will powers, which you could use all the time, and daily powers, which you could use once per day. The powers were then fueled by the arcane, the divine, martial prowess, or other. An example of other could be a monk harnessing the power of their soul energy. The focus on combat was immense, and I'm not going to disparage this as combat is a huge part of D&D. Well, it's a huge part of most D&D games. I certainly have sessions with my group that don't descend into combat, everyone's just getting really into other things or roleplaying super well. But we aren't a group that doesn't like combat, so the sessions will more often than not have combat in them. However, we don't obsess over it, and this is something that 4th edition did do. It brought combat to be the absolute overarching factor of the game. However, some players liked the way combat was changed, and if we compare it directly to 5th edition, we can see a reason why many players still steal things from 4th to use in their 5th edition campaigns. For example, let's compare giants in the 4th edition monster manual with the 5th. As we can see here, 5th edition fire giants have a greatsword and a rock, and 5th edition frost giants have a great axe and a rock, whereas the 4th edition versions contrast significantly. The frost giants had an icy great axe as a standard and then also dying swipe when their health drops to zero. They also had chilling strike, icy hand axe, and ice bound footing. Fire giants had iron greatsword, sweeping sword, and iron javelin. They contrasted far more than the almost copy and paste that happens in 5th edition. So, this is potentially one good thing about 4th edition you might say. So, why did 4th edition fail? Well, it was partly down to the huge popularity of 3.5 edition which people didn't want to stop playing. 
and to which they enjoy the customizable options of your character, even if the amount of permutations in third could be argued were too many. However, when it comes down to it, it just seems like wizards abandoned their target market, and in one awkward advertising campaign just actively disparaged all other editions. <laughs> The edition was third. The D20 system was king. D&D was clearly now an institution. The books were many. The gameplay was deep. And the rules were sometimes involved. I grapple. What? I grapple the troll. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you do that? Hang on. No worries. I got it. Right here. The great book. Grapple. 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 Uh, four steps. Step one, attack of opportunity. You provoke an attack of opportunity from the target you are All trying right. to grab. I slash him with my sword. Great. Thank you. and dragons will not be the game it is if not for constant evolution and innovation but this i pledge to you while there will be room for refinement the game will remain the same the game will remain the same yeah pretty awkward not to mention the fact that people just generally felt like wizards were desperately trying to squeeze their fans out of as much money as possible I mean, this edition had three monster manuals, three player handbooks, and two dungeon master guides. There was also a big push for players to use minis and grid maps, and whilst most old players would know that they didn't have to buy into these things, for new players it was definitely pushed for in the core books. So where was the Forgotten Realms in 4th edition? Although 4th edition technically started in the year of Blue Fire, 1385DR, when the Spell Plague began, the actual 4th edition adventure didn't start until the end of the Spell Plague when it had stabilised in 1486DR. But what is the Spell Plague? In the year 1385, the goddess of magic, Mistra, was assassinated by Siric in a plot hatched by the goddess of darkness, Shah. Siric and Shah are majorly reoccurring evil deities in the Forgotten Realms, and for those that have played the original Barlow's Gate games, you may recognise Siric's name as he popped up a lot, and was actually a mortal not so long ago, who slew Baal, Lord of Murder, when the mortals walked the earth during the time of troubles. After this, he ascended to godhood and constantly involved himself in various schemes, one of which in 1385 caused the Spell Plague. With Mistra's death, the weave, which is the source of all magic, was ripped apart, and unleashed raw magic. It first manifested in Toril, specifically in the land of Halrua, as a storm of blue flames which grew to a gargantuan size. The Halruan lands were laid to waste by wild magic that was being produced from this storm. And in Dragon Magazine number 362 from February 2008, we can see an article written by Brian R. James, who writes from the perspective of Arlenia Kithmeyer, who witnessed the events firsthand. Reaching out northwest from beyond the horizon's rim, I beheld a sight which was once horrifying as it was beautiful. A storm-like catastrophe rolling across the sky which seemed to be ablaze with blue fire. Frozen in stupefying awe, I witnessed the cerulean thunderhead crash into the mighty Leergal, throwing pillars of azure fire skyward to snatch at Saloon's calming light. Saloon, my gods, the surface of the moon, long presented to us mortals as a barren landscape of craters and lifeless valleys, now revealed to me majestic mountains and sprawling seas, itself alight with similar cobalt radiance. A nearby exclamation from the mage hound returned my attention earthward to witness a shimmering wall of sapphire flame racing down the hair pass. Five breaths longer and the storm would crash into the battlement upon which I stood with a handful of loom wardens. I recall hastily whispered prayers to Azuth 
a moment of unqualified stillness, and then nothing. This issue of Dragon Magazine also provides a fairly comprehensive timeline of events during the Spell Plague, as well as the effects of Ebir. Ebir was the twin planet to Toril and held in a pocket plane. Although they shared the same sun and moon, travel between the two was almost impossible, even through planar travel. Abir and Toril used to be one planet before the Overgod Io split them in two creating Abir as a separate world, for the Primordials after the Dawn War. However, during the Spell Plague many aspects of the two planets merged again. For example, an entire continent to the east of Faerun called Mastika was teleported to the world of Abir, and the Abir continent of Lerkond was teleported to Toril. Yes, things get pretty um, crazy during 4th edition Forgotten Realms. Not only did Mastika disappear from Toril, but according to the 2008 Forgotten Realms campaign guide, the Chultan jungle on Toril became home to many creatures and monsters from Abir. Evermeet, the last true kingdom of elves on Toril, was pushed into the plain of fairy. The land Mullerhand was completely annihilated during the spell plague, causing the Mullerhandian pantheon of gods to disappear. And these are all really the tip of the iceberg as a hell of a lot of things happened and it all gets a little overwhelming. One of the main effects of the spell plague upon the mages of Toril were that spells became incredibly unreliable. Either they would not work at all or they would produce incredibly unpredictable and unreliable effects. Now I don't really like this period of Forgotten Realms lore. It kind of feels like they try to change too much too quickly, which is a big problem in a world that is already crammed with information. I really love Forgotten Realms lore and the stories within it, but I'd be lying if I said that it's well organised, and this really shows in 4th edition. If we compare it to the lore of Middle-earth, which can also be complex, we can see that the Forgotten Realms during 4th edition really fails to provide any way that players of D&D or fans of the Forgotten Realms in general can follow the historical changes in the world. It is just overwhelming and it creates a vast amount of inconsistencies. It's the reason why you could go online and say something about the Forgotten Realms, only to have someone say, actually, and come at you with a whole different version of events. It's a mess, and that's why after the events of the Second Sundering which led to 5th edition, the lore of the realms improved a great deal. But that's for next time. Thanks for watching guys, if you enjoyed this video then do please give me a like and subscribe. If you're interested in Baldur's Gate 3 then I'm planning on putting out some more videos before it's likely early access release on the 30th of September. I'll be doing gameplay videos when it releases, but it'll be more with a focus on the lore. So I'll play, but when I come across something interesting in the world, I'll do a little explanation on it. See you next time everyone. Bye!